You know, viewer, unlike other people who may have a more negative opinion, I don't inherently hate the idea of remaking things, especially video games, when the remake is done for a reason, because the technological upgrades that we've seen as generations have moved on has made it possible to fix old video game problems, such as art direction limits, disk space, and bullshit difficulty. So games like Metroid Zero Mission are all right in my book as an idea. Yes, it may be more commonplace today to see remakes and remasters, but it's an idea that has persisted since the early 2000s and possibly even earlier. Why am I discussing this now? We'll get to that later. Now, what is Thousand Year Door? It's Intelligent Systems' next foray into the Mario RPG genre, where they've been given a bit more time and more of a budget on a console that has blown the Nintendo 64 out of the water in terms of processing power. It was a chance for the developer that already proved themselves to stretch their legs a bit more and further parodied the storytelling tropes that have been following Mario since his inception. The typical missions, cliches, and kidnappings are all back to become jokes once again, yet it's done in a more satisfying way with the level of unique design and art direction turned up to an amazing degree. Even from Paper Mario's quirky ass standards, this game wasn't going to be your typical Mario game. And let's start off by explaining minute one as Mario gets off the boat from the start of the game. Instead of an idyllic hub world where happy-go-lucky toads, bean bean people, or whoever, roam about conducting their lives in complete peace, Thousand Year Door has Mario starting his adventure in the absolute shithole that is Rogue Town. A rundown, tiny neighborhood filled with shady people, constant anger, and most importantly, crime, to the point that this podunk town of five square miles has two rivaling syndicates ruling the streets. I mean, the second you come into the town center, you see they have a goddamn gallows front and center for maximum what the fuck points. And supposedly, Princess Peach came here and found a magic treasure map. Well, that's one way to hook your audience in the first two minutes, intelligence systems. Well done! And it certainly doesn't stop from that point as Mario finds the Thousand Year Door and receives magic instructions to go find the Crystal Stars. The stated reason is that Mario and company think that Princess Peach has gone after them and she's still lost. It's surprising that the whole game treats this as the first time that Princess Peach has ever been kidnapped because otherwise, they'd know where she disappeared to. And because of logic, they also think that Princess Peach can fight a dragon. At least, they don't keep going on with that plot point as the ghost is given up by Chapter 2 when Mario receives his first email from the captured princess. At worst, the plot is inconsistent as Mario is collecting the crystal stars for a combination of reasons, to stop the bad guy, rescue Princess Peach, and most importantly, just to have the crystal stars until people explain to Mario how they will help with anything. At least the player is given some beautiful worlds and great missions to complete that manage to poke fun at old cliches of video game stories. They're entertaining, light, and above all fun to finish since they take place in unique locations and have interesting characters. It's all together to make a fun RPG work. Like I said, the first chapter has them doing the typical fantasy story of fighting a dragon in a castle, and then there's the more famous chapters 3 and 6, where Mario has to enter a fighting league and solve detective novel mysteries that shows off the heights that Intelligent can reach if they put their mind to it in some of the most masterpiece level role-playing game levels I've ever seen. It's the reason why Thousand Year Door is what people think of when the Nintendo GameCube is remembered alongside a few other titles. The story that Intelligent tells are well paced with the plot only moving as fast as it needs to be and all the interactions are exactly where they need to be and even with some of the weaker chapters, Intelligent never strayed from that high level of writing quality. And that's not even taking into account the combat you'll be experiencing in solving all of these characters' problems. Now, Intelligent could have easily just given us the exact same turn-based setup from their first game with some new allies, badges, and special moves. And while the game does get that down, they also added a couple of things. 
most notably the stage that the battles take place on, which in Paper Mario was just the place where battles took place and nothing else. But in Thousand Year Door, it's actually put into the combat in a Super Smash Bros. style of dicking with the combat. Occasionally during fights, you'll have off-screen objects fall under the combat, the background will fall down and even audience members jumping onto the stage to directly interfere with the combat. However, most of the negative effects are slated against the player, which is a bit unfair when the stage starts causing freezing, burning, and explosions to occur. And yes, the stage has an audience and they actually matter when the fights happen. Their role is to fill the player's star power meter after most attacks, depending on how flashy they execute action commands. If you want to know more, read up on stylish moves. I have absolutely no idea what they are. They also have the ability to throw things at Mario. When this happens, a Kingdom Hearts 2 style QT will pop up on screen, prompting you to scan the audience looking for the object in question. Then you have a choice to either stop the throw or not, depending on what it is. It's an addition to the normal Paper Mario combat that gives the right amount of random chance to a turn-based model to keep it from getting boring, and for the most part, the random events don't completely screw your ability to win fights, even if you are ostensibly at the same chance of getting hit as the opponents from anything that the stage is throwing. Considering that the game's combat is the same thing from Paper Mario, just given a bit more technological touches, I would like to bring back the whole remake idea from the top of this video, because Thousand Year Door feels like a remake of Paper Mario and the game that Intelligent actually wanted to make on the Nintendo 64, but couldn't due to the console's limitations. At so, so many points, you see that Intelligent is lifting ideas from their first game wholesale to put them into TTYD. The entire fifth chapter of Keel Hall Key is almost a direct copy of Lava Lava Island, for example. Goombella here is Goombario 2.0. Petalburg is literally Koopa Village just in another game. Chapter 7, where Mario goes to the moon, is incredibly similar to Crystal King's Palace. And then there's the return of Merlin's family of sorcerers and so many other similarities that I can't possibly list them all here today. There's the obvious homage to the original game where the entire art style features that island-based segments based off of Nintendo 64's space limitations, but I can't imagine that was necessary on the GameCube other than to stick to the familiar style. The main thing here is that while Intelligent brings a lot of the old ideas back for more, the old ideas aren't used as a crutch to be lazy. Thousand Year Door has its own ideas and its own points that it wants to make, and that's why it feels like a good remake of Paper Mario rather than a missed mark. It's clever and endearing while throwing the player into ridiculous situations, pitting them up against dragons, poltergeists, and the concept of the apocalypse resting beneath their feet. Yeah, rather than having a massive treasure be the ultimate goal, sort of like Borderlands, halfway through the game it's shown that the treasure is a sealed away cataclysm that destroyed the old town of Rogueport and cracked the world 1,000 years ago. It turns from being camp and colorful to a bit more dire underneath the same vibrancy of a world that does not know. Again, the story as the biggest requirement for an RPG to work well is expertly written and paced well, with the twist being hidden and foreshadowed effectively between the pre-traveling planning with Mario and Frankly and the Princess Peach bits after each chapter end that gives us plot details through a really a really odd and intangible relationship being built between the captive Princess Peach and the villain supercomputer Tech. It's one of those things that falls mainly to your own interpretation as a whole, but the fact about it is that Tech develops the relationship because he's falling for Princess Peach emotionally, and Princess Peach is hoping to get some practical things out of Tech such as communicating with Mario without the villain knowing. And then to distract the player from the oddness of those bits, they then throw Bowser into the plot as 100% comic relief, because his plot is incredibly stupid, and the situations he gets involved with are hilarious to say the least. However, Intelligent does rarely put him into the main plot, such as part of the final boss battle in the game, which was as misguided a move as was possible to make. 
It's a hard thing to describe how well Thousand Year Door works as a 40 hour RPG, other than saying it has good combat, characters, and storytelling, and it's ultimately a giant rewarding experience. I mean, it's a classic for a reason and it outshines the original game since it's the one that Intelligent Systems wanted to make in the first place with all its tropes and wonderful 3D animation intact. Some people might think that using 2D animation is a lazy cop-out and models like Gloomtail and Shadow Queen are out to prove them wrong. Ultimately, Thousand Year Door has all the elements necessary to make an interesting RPG, an incredibly fun game, between its never knowing what's behind the next corner design and pioneering combat ideas. If you don't have the game and are even remotely interested in the series or the genre, then you need to get it any way possible even if you have to buy an old GameCube, since emulating it is kind of a feat, not unlike Super Mario RPG was. So yeah, Intelligent hit another classic game right on the head, and hopefully they never stop, like Platinum Games does. Next week we'll be doing another Mario game, as we've only hit the halfway point on the list of games I have planned from the series, on a title in 2004. So enjoy the final score, and a final victory for gamers, because we can still enjoy stuff like this. See you guys next time.